Hey, 42 here. No matter how good you are at your job, sooner or later you'll have a bad day at the office. You'll mess up a presentation, accidentally hit on your boss's daughter, or forget to go on mute when you put the telly on during a Zoom call. Whatever it is, the consequences are usually fairly minor. You'll have to spend 10 minutes on the naughty step, your boss assaults you with a stapler, that sort of thing. But then there are some jobs where a bad day at work can be the difference between life and death. On the 18th of September 2012, a British man called Chris Lemons had one of the worst bad days at the office in history. It started fairly normally, but ended with Chris lying on the bottom of the North Sea with five minutes of breathable air left in his emergency tanks. Being 19 meters deep, there was no way to swim to the surface, and whilst help was on the way, his rescuers wouldn't show up for more than 35 minutes. You don't need to be a mathematician to see that those numbers added up to Chris being as dead as the Dead Sea. Except this video is not about a deep sea tragedy, quite the opposite. It's about one of the most incredible survival stories I've ever come across. Because despite spending more than 30 minutes at the bottom of the North Sea with nothing to breathe, Chris Lemons is still very much alive. As for how? Well, that's a very good question. But before I answer it, I just need to tell you what the hell Chris was doing down there in the first place. And to do that, I need to introduce you to one of the most hardcore professions known to man, figure skating. Oh, no, hang on, wrong video. One of the most hardcore professions known to man, commercial saturation diving. A job so extreme, almost nobody seems to know it even exists, let alone how it works. Raid is a mobile game that is free to play, with millions of players and over 80 million downloads already. It's a huge amount of fun and has incredible graphics. My favourite part of the game is collecting all the champions. There are over 800 to collect and customise, and it's updated every month with tons of bosses to take on. Now, let's play a game, Kiss, Marry, Kill with Raid Champions. I'd kiss Kalia for her warrior-like spirit, marry Queen Eva because he wouldn't want to marry royalty, right? But I'd have to say goodbye to Ethos. Sorry. And guess what? Rage just brought in the ultimate warrior from the 90s, Xena Warrior Princess, complete with her sword, whip, and chakram. You can recruit Xena through the new Champion Pass feature, with Xena as the ultimate reward. You can also summon her from Ancient or Sacred Shards during special summon boosts every week between November the 10th and January the 19th, 2024. Go check out Xena Warrior Princess in-game right now, and a special thanks to Universal Studios licensing. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Click my link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses available only via my link. We're talking an epic champion, Knight Errant from Bannerlord's faction, and other useful things like energy refills, skilled home, and an XP booster. Once you're in and you're crushing enemies, find me under the name 42, and if you're fast enough, you can join my clan. One of the biggest dangers in scuba diving is something called decompression sickness, also known as the bends. When breathing pressurized air at depth, gases like nitrogen are naturally absorbed into body tissues. As a diver ascends at the end of a dive, this absorbed gas is released. If he ascends, decompresses too fast, the released gas can form tiny bubbles in his tissues and blood, causing symptoms as mild as joint pain and as severe as death. For recreational divers who follow so-called no decompression dive profiles, the bends is very rarely an issue. But recreational divers only go down to a maximum of 40 meters, and usually much shallower. Commercial divers, on the other hand, work at depths of up to 300 meters. And safely returning to the surface after spending a prolonged period at that kind of depth can take up to two weeks. To put that into perspective, that's longer than it took the Apollo 11 astronauts to get back from the moon. Commercial saturation divers can lug hundreds of deep sea dives per year as they build and maintain oil and gas infrastructure on the seabed. But if they have to spend days or weeks decompressing after every dive, that kind of volume should be impossible, right? Well, here's where modern technology changes the game. This space age contraption is what's known as a diving chamber. It's basically a very high tech living habitat with a very clever trick up its sleeve. 
the atmosphere inside can be precisely adjusted to match the pressures found on the ocean floor. The concept here is simple. Since days or weeks of decompression after every dive would be impractical, just don't decompress. That, in a nutshell, is saturation diving. During a stint at sea, which usually lasts for about four weeks, saturation divers will live inside a pressurized diving chamber inside the belly of a large ship. When it's time to dive, they're lowered to the ocean floor in a small pressurized room called a diving bell. They do whatever it is they need to do on the bottom, then hop back into the diving bell and up again to the diving chamber. Throughout this whole process, the ambient pressure experienced by the divers matches that found at the depth they're working. And since there's no pressure change, there's no risk of decompression sickness in between dives. It's an extremely clever system that allows human divers to reach deep sea infrastructure that would otherwise be impossible to maintain. In theory, it's brilliant. But the reality is, well, it's a bit crap. For one thing, working at these depths and pressures is incredibly physically demanding. The divers will be in the water every single day of a month-long operation, with each dive lasting about six hours. Unless you can run a sub-three-hour marathon whilst wearing a fat suit, or crack coconuts between your bare ass cheeks, you probably aren't fit enough to be a saturation diver. Then there's the living conditions. The divers are housed in what is basically a tiny prison cell with air pressures higher than those found in a bicycle tyre. There's no privacy, no time off, no alcohol, there isn't even any sunlight. The divers do have access to the internet and can speak to their loved ones on the phone, but most rarely call home, and for good reason. The gas inside the diving chamber is something called heliox, a mixture of helium and oxygen, the same stuff they breathe during a dive. If you've ever inhaled the contents of a helium balloon, you'll know it gives you a hilarious cartoon-like voice for a few seconds. Inside a diving chamber, saturation drivers have that same suddenly not quite so hilarious voice for a month straight. And that month is very much non-negotiable. At the kind of depths at which commercial saturation divers typically operate, the bends is almost certain to be fatal. Leave the chamber prematurely, and you're dead. It doesn't matter what happens in the outside world. Your partner could die. Your house could burn down. Aliens might invade planet Earth. You cannot leave. It's like being on Big Brother, except you get to keep your dignity. So yeah, commercial saturation diving is brutally demanding. The claustrophobic living conditions are like some kind of elaborate practical joke. And if anything goes wrong, you're fucked. Which brings me neatly back to Chris Lemons. In September 2012, he was one of a dozen saturation divers working from a ship called the Bibi Topaz in the North Sea, 125 miles east of Aberdeen. Chris was on a three-man team with Dave Uassa and Duncan Alcock. As per standard safety protocols, only two of the divers were ever in the water at the same time. On the 18th of September 2012, it was Chris and Dave, with Duncan hanging back in the diving bell. As the so-called bellman, it was Duncan's job to prepare the divers and look after their gear, particularly their umbilicals, cable-like tethers that feed the divers gas, hot water, and power when they're in the water. The umbilicals also allow for real-time communication between the divers and the ship. The job that day was to replace a section of pipe and carry out a few basic checks inside a large underwater structure called a manifold. It was about as routine as things get in the world of commercial saturation diving, with the only minor concern being the weather on the surface, where winds of 40 miles per hour were buffeting the Bibi Topaz and whipping up four meter waves. Not that that was such a big deal. Bad weather in the North Sea is a bit like vomit on the pavement outside your local pub. It's inevitable. 
Ships like Bibi Topaz are built to deal with it thanks to a neat piece of kit called a Dynamic Positioning System, or DPS, which is essentially a kind of autopilot that keeps the ship steady over a single spot on the seabed, even in rough seas. Chris, Dave and Duncan started their shift at about 9pm that evening, descending in the diving bell before Chris and Dave hopped out to get to work inside the manifold. To begin with, everything went according to plan, but about an hour into the dive, an alarm suddenly started blaring. Alarms are evil little bastards at the best of times, but they're especially unwelcome when you're 19 metres underwater. Instructions from the ship above arrived within a few seconds, and they did nothing to calm anybody's nerves. Chris and Dave were told to get the hell out of there as fast as possible. The divers reacted instantly, climbing first to the top of the manifold, then using their umbilicals like rope to get up to the diving bell. Dave made it there safely, but Chris's umbilical had looped itself around a stray piece of pipe on top of the manifold. He tried to untangle himself, but to his horror, the umbilical wouldn't budge. It was growing taut in his hands, the material groaning audibly as the tension increased. That shouldn't have been possible. There was always plenty of slack in the umbilicals. Unless... Suddenly, Chris realised exactly what must be happening. 90 metres above his head, the Bibi Topaz was drifting. And if the ship was drifting, that meant Chris had just become the anchor. You probably don't need me to tell you this, but human beings do not make very good anchors. We just don't have the metal for it. As the Bibi Topaz drifted further from the dive site, Chris's umbilical grew even tighter, until, all of a sudden, it snapped, throwing him clear off the manifold. Short of being eaten by a megalodon, it was just about the worst situation he could possibly have found himself in. His suit was equipped with about five minutes of emergency gas, but if he didn't get back to the diving bell before it ran out, he was dead. The first thing he had to do was get to the manifold, but there was a problem. Actually, there were three. When Chris's umbilical snapped, he didn't only lose his supply of oxygen, he also lost his power, hot water, and comms. No power meant no light. No hot water meant no protection from the ambient water temperature of about four degrees Celsius. And no comms meant there was no one to tell him just what the hell was going on. In other words, Chris was totally alone, in pitch darkness, in freezing cold water, 90 metres beneath the surface of the North Sea. He'd found himself in the world's most horrific escape room, where there were only five minutes to solve all of the puzzles and failure meant certain death. With little of a choice, Chris picked himself up and just headed off in a random direction. Despite quite literally not being able to see his own hand in front of his face, by some minor miracle he quickly found the manifold, and from there he somehow managed to climb 11 metres to the top. By that point he'd done everything he could to assist the rescue attempt he knew, well, hoped, was coming. All that was left to do now was wait. That and try to breathe slowly. It's hard to imagine what Chris was going through in those moments. It had taken him around three minutes to climb the manifold, so he had at most a couple of minutes of air left. If someone was coming to rescue him, he'd see their lights long before he saw them, but the darkness was absolute. As the precious seconds ticked by and it became harder to breathe, he knew with absolute certainty that he was about to die. Not many people get such a good long look at the Grim Reaper before he swings his scythe. Meanwhile, 90 metres straight up, well, not straight up, that was kind of the whole bloody problem. Meanwhile, somewhere vaguely overhead, the crew of the Bibi Topaz were in the middle of a full-scale emergency. The dynamic positioning system had suffered a catastrophic failure, and despite frantic efforts to fix it, it remained about as responsive as a four-week-old corpse. Without the DPS, the ship was at the mercy of the towering waves and 40 mile an hour winds and it was drifting further away from Chris's position by the second. Shit hadn't so much hit the fan as completely buried it. One small piece of good news was that the Bibi Topaz was equipped with an ROV, a small submersible with a front-facing camera that could be operated remotely from the ship. 
So whilst the crew wrestled with the DPS, the ROV was dispatched to the dive site to try and locate Chris. It arrived 16 minutes after the accident, meaning Chris had been without oxygen for approximately 11 minutes. The footage recorded by the ROV's camera that night, relayed live to the ship, is, well, it's difficult to watch. Chris was lying on his side on the top of the manifold. You might think he would have been deathly still, but he wasn't. He was twitching, his arms, hands and legs jerking at random. He was slowly suffocating to death. Dive ships like the Bibi Topaz have large crews and close to 100 people gathered to watch the feed from the ROV. It must have been a harrowing experience. These men and women stood less than 200 meters from where Chris lay, but he might as well have been on the International Space Station, for all they could do to help was stand there and watch as their friend slowly died. As the minutes ticked by, Chris's twitching slowed and eventually stopped. Nobody was giving up, but it was clear that this was no longer a rescue operation. It was a mission to recover the body. Approximately 28 minutes after the accident, the DPS suddenly flickered back into life. The crew immediately set a course for the dive site, and Dave Uasa, who'd stayed in the water beneath the diving bell, prepared himself mentally and physically for what was to come next. A few minutes later, the Bibi Topaz was back over the manifold, and Dave made his move. Working as fast as he could, he clipped himself to the body and somehow hauled himself back up his own umbilical and onto the staging area beneath the dive bell. Then he attached Chris's body to a recovery system, which pulled it inside. Waiting there was bellman Duncan Alcock, and he wasted no time tearing off Chris's helmet. His entire head was bright blue and cold to the touch. He was obviously dead, but Duncan had to at least try. It's impossible to know exactly when Chris's air supply ran out, but assuming the emergency tank lasted the estimated five minutes it was supposed to, at this point Chris had taken his last breath approximately 31 minutes earlier. Duncan forced two deep lungfuls of air into Chris's mouth, and then something incredible happened. After half an hour of lying alone on the bottom of the North Sea, Chris Lemons <gasps> breathed. A few seconds later, he pulled himself fully into the diving bell and sat down in his usual seat, apparently unharmed. If you're hoping I'm about to explain how this apparent miracle happened, I'm afraid you're out of luck, because the truth is, nobody knows for sure. By all rights, Chris Lemons should be dead. When the brain is deprived of oxygen, irreversible brain damage usually sets in at around the four minute mark, with death following a couple of minutes after that. Chris went over half an hour without oxygen, but so far as anyone can tell, he suffered no ill effects whatsoever. The best theory anyone's come up with so far as to how that's possible is that two elements of the accident worked in Chris's favor. The first was the cold. The moment Chris's suit lost its hot water supply, his body was exposed to the four degrees Celsius waters of the North Sea. That's about the temperature of your average ice bath. As he lay there on the top of the manifold after losing consciousness, his body began to cool rapidly. This sudden drop in temperature would have dramatically slowed Chris's metabolic processes, reducing his oxygen consumption. The second factor was the gas mix he was breathing. Helios contains a higher partial pressure of oxygen than the air we breathe up here on the surface. And Chris hadn't just been breathing it during the dive, he'd been living in a diving chamber full of the stuff for weeks. As a result, Chris's tissues would have been more highly saturated with oxygen than a regular person meaning he had more stores to draw upon as the breathless minutes ticked by. Put those two things together and we can at least get somewhere close towards understanding what happened that day. Deep sea saturation diving is one of the most extreme jobs on earth and it takes a special kind of person to be able to face the unique challenges it brings. To give you an idea of just how special Chris is, let me tell you what happens next. After the incident, the Bibi Topaz headed straight back to Aberdeen for debriefing. After four days decompressing, the divers emerged from the diving chamber so doctors could give them a full checkup. After they'd convinced themselves that Chris wasn't some kind of zombie merman, they gave him two choices. 
He could take some time off to process what had happened, or he could get back out there. Chris had just come within a whisker of dying in one of the scariest, loneliest ways imaginable. And yet, he didn't consider quitting even for an instant. Just three weeks after the accident, he, Dave Uassa, and Duncan Alcock were back on the bottom of the North Sea. Choosing to continue his career as a saturation diver was an incredibly brave move. But Chris went one step further. On his very first dive after the incident, along with Dave and Duncan, he returned to the very same manifold that had almost become his tomb. They'd gone back to finish the job. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses for new players with an epic champion. And thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video.